So yeah, welcome, welcome to this discussion about the role that DAOs have in uh, governing our common resources or governing our commons. And one thing we'll be looking at today is like what might be the difference between commons or common resources, are there any? Um, and if you want to start by popping your view on gallery, uh, if you're just on speaker, then as I introduce our amazing panel, I'll ask them to give a little wave. So um, yeah, welcome. Welcome everyone. Um, so we're joined this evening by four, um, four in in people that have incredible amounts of experience and wealth in DAOs and DAO creation. Um, um, so the first uh, panel member is Julio Holland. Um, if you give everyone a little wave, Julio. So Julio is an architect for distributed financial solutions. He's a game designer and facilitator, and he's interested in building new regenerative cultures and economies for organizations, communities, and ecosystems. And HyferDAO, that he is a member of, play uh, a huge role in um, creating the Seeds platform, which is a conscious currency that aims to finance the planetary regenerative renaissance. So huge welcome to Julio. Julio's also um, joined today by Joost Schuten, who is also a Hyper Earth DAO member. And Joost has been working for more than two decades in helping people to do the work that they care about. Um, through utilizing skills and passions and through self-organization. Um, now he primarily focuses on the systemic power shift needed in organizations to make them purpose-driven. And he's worked on upgrading legal, capital and incentive structures in different capacities and on decision-making processes so that people and organizations can create the impact they desire effectively and at scale. So a huge welcome. And then we're also joined by two members of Common Stacks and the Token Engineering Commons. Firstly, we have Jessica Sartler. Give us a little wave, Jessica. Jessica is the Ecosystem Development and Special Project Director for the Common Stack, the Communications Advisor and Research Coordinator for Block Science and a steward of the Token Engineering Commons. Not only that, she is a token engineering governance researcher, a blockchain anthropologist, and an award-winning journalist. So huge welcome. And we're also joined by Livia, who's also a Common Stacks and Tech. Um, she's part of the Common Stack team and is leading the cultural build of the token engineering commons. She's interested in warm economics behavioral science and participatory decision-making. So hello to our panel, it's such a joy to have you here. So um, I'm just gonna pop the four of you into the spotlight and then we'll start with um, some questions to get you going. Brilliant. So our first question, please, is to uh, Livia. Can you give us a brief explanation of what a commons, what, what is a commons, and why does Eleanor Ostrom's eight principles for governing a commons, uh, why was it so groundbreaking? Um, yeah, so a commons, I think we all have an intuitive understanding of something that is uh, commons to all, that it's shared. And I think a commons in the sense of um, a path beyond what we've seen from DAOs um, has something to do with the choice to collaborate and to create better institutions, to um, enjoy shared resources shared uh, resource systems. So 
I think is understanding that um, commons has a very human connotation. So mm -hmm. I think this understanding of the human is very important to uh, substitute, in my opinion, the more cold DAO. And when we talk about commons, we immediately have this understanding that we're sharing something. Mm -hmm. And the way uh, Austrium's work is so important for this uh, steps toward more warm economies we're taking is, is because there is three influential uh, models that are the tragedy of the commons, the prisoner's dilemma, and the, um, and the, and the logic of collective action. So this three models have been basing what we have in terms of state and market solutions for governing the commons, for govern governing natural resources. And as, as we all might share this feeling, it hasn't been working so well. So uh, Ostrom offers a set of principles that for the first time were introduced as an alternative to this three influential models. So as for so long, we had the academia, the politics and uh, the practice of governance that we were seeing showing us that we could not collaborate rationally, that there was so many blocks for, um, for, for shared governance, for self-managing resources and self-managing organizations and institutions. Ostrom um, does this very beautiful research on many, on many commons that were actually on land. So she researches uh, water basins, uh, farms, uh, uh, fishery supplies. So many common pool resources that she call CPRs all over the world to look from this empirical research, what were principles that could uh, offer um, a, a design solution for how humans can organize themselves. So we've been following these eight principles and implementing them into our cultural build to try um, seeing for a digital commons, how this can apply and what are the challenges we have. And also as Ostrom uh, talks about in her book, uh, there's this governing the commons um, it's the, the book she won the, the Nobel Prize in Economics for. So as she mentions here, those are challenges. Uh, governing natural resources are challenges that we don't have, um, we don't have a final answer. So there is a lot of uh, trial and error of empirical experimentation and research to still go further in this field. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you so much. And Julio, can you share a bit with us about what a DAO is? Because that obviously plays a huge uh, role in this conversation. And specifically, like, why are we here exploring uh, the role that DAOs have in managing the commons? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, you know, a DAO is an acronym for a distributed autonomous organization, right? It's uh, actually, this became possible with the advent of the blockchain and what we are calling Web 3.0. And so it's, it's the web that allows us to safely store and share data, right? So in, in a secure way, it, it, in a way that's non, not temperable by government, governments or, or institutions. So we have, uh, we have tools now to organize ourselves around the globe with this, uh, through the internet, of course. And, uh, and the DAO is just one of the possible responses to collectively organizing uh, resources, right? So basically the, the general idea is that um, a bunch of people come together with uh, maybe money or resources that they want to manage together. And each one of them uh, receives a set of tokens or, or coins or currencies uh, or points for depending the, the amount of resources they share. And then these points allow them to vote on this, uh, on this institution 
to allocate resources to projects. So without a centralized authority, without uh, any boss telling them what to do, so they, they can collectively vote and decide how to spend their own resources. So that's the basic idea behind the DAO. So this is one of the possible solutions that has been uh, tested uh, for, for governing uh, digital commons, so or digital organizations like this. So it's very exciting to be seeing this emerging as a, as a solution. But there are many unanswered questions yet on how to scale this, how to, uh, you know, so that, that's very, uh, yeah, basically that's, that's what, what a DAO is. Of course, we had the first DAO emerging on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and it, it was a very interesting experiment, although it kind of failed because the, most of the money was kind of stolen and there was like a, a scandal uh, happening. Uh, but in, in any case, uh, it served as a, a good lesson on what can be done. And uh, we are still in the infancy of this technology, but uh, this could really be a, a game changer for uh, managing resources around the planet without having pyramid out, uh, strength, pyramid uh, power structures to, to manage us. So yeah, that's it. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, Jessica, just like picking up on something that Gila just said about um, issuing tokens. So that seems to be one of the unique elements of a DAO is that they can create and issue tokens. But what is a token and what does it mean to tokenize? What kind of things do DAOs normally tokenize? Yeah, thanks, Anna Maria. I hope you can hear me. I had to switch headphones. Thank you. Um, so yeah, if you look it up in the dictionary, a token is kind of a tangible representation of a fact, quality, feeling, or a voucher. So it, it really is just something that can resent, uh, represent something else. It's kind of a container. So there are physical tokens, like when you go to an arcade, when you're a kid and you trade money for a token, and that gives you access to play video games. Um, so now we also have digital tokens. And there are two main ty uh, types of tokens. There are fungible, um, which just means you can swap it out. So kind of like the US dollar or the Euro, one is equal to one, or you have non-fungible. So you may have heard this lately, NFTs uh, coming in kind of the mainstream news. So non-fungible just means that they don't necessarily have a one-to-one, -one, you can't swap them. So say my Babe Ruth baseball card, I want to trade for your Michael Jordan baseball card. So it's not really a one-to-one, -one. they kind of hold a different uh, representation. Uh, and in this context with DAOs, the, the very cool thing about digital tokens is we can program them with rights and access. So again, going to that kind of arcade example. So this token that you trade money for, it gives you access to play video games. And now we can program digital tokens for pretty much anything. Um, they're just a container. So we can program them for governance rights. We can program them for reputation. We can assign it a value or we can open it to the market and allow the markets to dictate the value. Um, and also they can be transferable or non-transferable. So like at the arcade, you can't exchange that token and get your money back. That kind of vests you in the arcade economy, if you will. Um, and at the common stack, we have a non-transferable reputation token that we're using called CSAC that we use to assign a score. And that score represents how much a person is aligned with our mission. And our mission, you know, being that somebody cares about collective, the collective over just individual benefits. And because that's transparent, it becomes this kind of signaling measure as well. So especially with non-fungible tokens, those NFTs that I was talking about that you may have heard of that are basically digital collectibles, this can be like a badge. So I could have an Inspire All community member NFT, and that has a reputation or a kind of connotation that translates even beyond language if someone just sees a symbol um, it kind of has this larger meaning uh, so that's just the the kind of tip of the iceberg here i don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole but tokens offer us this way to quantify or to represent things that are very hard to measure so even like a wedding ring you know this is kind of an expression or a representation of love that can't can't be measured. Uh, but in the case of DAOs, 
this is allowing for some incredible opportunity to get very intentional and very granular in the way that we assign and apply access control and rights at different layers within our communities, our economies and our commons. Thank you, that's so interesting. And um, yeah, I guess just jumping off that as well then. So Yost, because you've got obviously this wealth of experience in helping groups cooperate and collaborate and work better together, but you know, the idea of a DAO, even the idea of tokenizing, it sounds a bit removed from the kind of cooperation and collaboration that we're normally used to. So what, what would you see as the difference? Um, yeah, I, I love that exploration. And, um, and, and like you mentioned, my, my background is really from um, uh, self-organization and a distributed authority. How do we do that? And in, in that light, I also uh, dabbled into DAOs uh, and it's actually how I look at DAOs as well. And, and I, I almost think that DAO is the, the wrong term um, because I don't think uh, when, we, when, we, when we think of DAOs, we recognize them by a couple of characteristics. Um, and the sum of those characteristics don't make up an organization in, in, in my mind. Right, they they support and and serve and are great tools to help an organization do a couple of things a lot better, but they don't are an organization. I think when we all think of uh, organizations, we um, we think of um, rightly so like decision making and um, and uh, how do we deal with ownership, um, and I think those parts is really where DAO can help a lot. But we also think of um, people collaborating. And, and culture and lots of operational decisions that, that are not necessarily served by, by a DAO or a distributed authority. Um, a conflict resolution, I saw a question come through, like that um, there's so much in there uh, that, that so much that happens in organizations that is not necessarily dealt with in, in DAOs or the, those characteristics of DAOs yet. Um, so the, the Organizations are bigger than what, what DAOs currently uh, serve. Um, and I think it's really important to, to stay focused on, on the goal. And I personally am very much of the conviction that, that technology can really help us uh, serve these initiatives. Uh, they don't drive it, right? So to really stay rooted in, uh, um, in, in, in the human approach and uh, what is important for us and then figure out what is serving us collectively um, and make sure that everybody has a say in that, th those that are affected by and impacted by uh, the decisions we're making. Thank you. And it'd be really interesting to see if it comes up actually in the questions at all this, because you mentioned conflict there. And I know um, Jess and um, Livia in CommonStack, there is a, you've put a lot of time into that, into the conflict um, process. Be, there are people to support people if there are any so it'd be great. I wonder if that would come up in, in conversation and see what's happening at High for Earth with that as well. But just to bring it back as well to the, the questions at hand. Um, so I'm going to dive into the Slido, which is really busy. We've got some really great questions coming up. Um, the first one is anonymous, so I'll ask it on their behalf. But if we have one of the ones that has a name on, I'll, I'll bring them right into the panel and you can talk to them directly. So the first question we've voted up is how would small communities use DAO technologies? Um, who wants to dive off into that? Well, I, I can say one little um, little thing about it. I think what is uh, what I think is really interesting um, is to answer a couple of questions around uh, what the community is serving, right? I, I really like the exploration of is, is the community um, self-organizing around a specific purpose to create a certain impact or is the community self-organizing around serving those that are showing up, right? Are you self-organizing around the people or self-organizing around a purpose? And that's really gonna dictate um, what the DAO, uh, if you wanna use that, is gonna, is gonna serve. So, so my, my question would really be, um, what problems do you have that, that need a solution? Uh, and perhaps a DAO can help there. Uh, so I, I, I would, I would kind of bounce, bounce the question back to really figure out what, what those needs are. And I'm curious what, uh, to hear what others say. 
Yeah, I love that, Eost. I think just always coming from this perspective, I think uh, as technologists, we have a tendency to offer solutions before understanding what the needs are. And I think as one of the token engineering philosopher friends that we have always says, when you say you have a solution, you automatically create a problem. <laughs> so I love that you started with that. And I'd say maybe a little more tangible example, because a lot of this is kind of so ethereal still. And we, what we, uh, what I am very interested to see is how we can connect what we're kind of building up in the ether or, you know, in the sky and bring it down to the earth. And, and there are uh, a lot of ways that we can do that. But to focus on the question, I guess a really good example is right here in my backyard. I'm living in Ontario and there's uh, this place called the Bruce Trail. It's a beautiful uh, hiking um, path that crosses farms, private land, public land. And it's this multi-stakeholder system where you have this common resource uh, that people are sharing. So this is something that's a very kind of complex system, different rights, different access, different uh, maybe desires. And coming together as a community to manage this commons that is this hiking trail, we can really come together as a community with all these multiple stakeholders and figure out what is it that we want to incentivize? What is it that we want to do to care for this land? And people have different opinions. So if they create a a uh, DAO, or in our case, a commons, which is uh, also adding in this cultural and legal insulation, um, and what we're calling kind of warm DAO, uh, just having this intention behind mission alignment, we can come and say, okay, we want to incentivize picking up trash. So we all come, we pool our resources, we all put in $1,000, we launch our own token, and then we want to give that token to people who pick up trash. So they could grab a bag of trash. There's another project like this already, take a picture of themselves and kind of validate that. So we have this open design space, but uh, how could a small community use it? It's, it's to manage these multi-stakeholder systems that are collectively have an interest to take care of a public good. So when we create boundaries around that and, and we can get into some of Austin's principles, then, um, this helps to, you know, protect this in a way. Otherwise, if if there are no boundaries to the system, anybody can come and throw trash and, you know, defecate in your, your yard like this has actually happened. You know, these are the challenges that these small communities are facing. So, um, so yeah, that's just just one example of how a small community could use this technology to, to manage a common uh, resource. Yeah, thank you. Go, Olivia, please jump in. Yeah, if I can just add a point to that. I also think um, it's very interesting the questions that a DAO brings up. So sometimes even if a, a small community wants to become a DAO or a small project wants to become a DAO, um, the questions that we'll bring are, I think are always helpful, even if they don't end up becoming a DAO. Because if we think about the DAO just as the tool, like, oh, I have a tool in the blockchain that will let me um, uh, manage resources in a decentralized way. Uh, and and this I, I have the crypto resources that are locked in a smart contract. Like all of this is just the, the last point of it is one, of the tools that uh, the, the, the one of the facilities that this tool can offer. But if we start thinking about like, how would I use this tool? Like even this imaginary tool. And we've been doing that for the last uh, seven months, more or less with the TEC, the Token Engineering Commons. That is this cultural build phase of preparing the foundations to use something that is decentralized and this goes so much into our behavior and what are the things that we have to change in the relational fabric to get to um, a decentralized point that we're actually like going to make a good use of the tool and I agree a lot with what you said that is uh, is just a tool to help us so the search until we get there it's so I think it's very important. I just had one more thought actually. 
it's not just uh, also at this you just sparked my brain, Livia. It's not just, you know, managing resources, but also creating resources and co-vesting. So it's about self-funding and also self-governing. Um, so the beauty as well with cryptocurrency is until now, uh, printing money or the creation of currency has been centralized and now it is decentralized, kind of like the printing press came and decentralized publishing. Well, we've decentralized uh, currency. And so we're moving from economic monoculture uh, to economic permacultures. And we need this diversity. You know, if, if biology and living systems has shown us anything, it's that we need this diversity for survival. And now we have the opportunity to create our own currencies. And this gets into a little bit of the paradigm shift of what is money. Um, uh, but it is, is incredibly empowering for communities to be able to create their own token of value. And that can be backed by some kind of reserve currency uh, that can have a utility, which gives it a lot of value. But really when it comes down to it, uh, if you talk to most money, uh, you know, I guess economics uh, people in, in looking at this kind of paradigm shift, money is really just what we assign value to. It's about belief. It's almost like someone said, you know, almost like a religion. So if you believe it has value, it has value. So now communities can come together and decide uh, how is it that they want to pool resources and create more, more wealth or create their own currency. I love how practical and grounded and kind of specific you're saying that that they can be to help communities like it's it's practical um, and I'm going to ask um, Julio or, or Yost to pop in just in a minute because I know that a lot of the work on seeds is about you, you were looking at how specifically you can help communities um, but it also this conversation is making me think a lot about reports I read by Rethinking Humanity which is basically pointing to this big era shift that we're in at the moment and how that era shift is looking like we're moving towards what I think of as like networked localization. And so at the heart of that are gonna be communities and commons and people self-managing and um, taking ownership. But the fact that they can then also use that to create resources like tokens is really interesting. But yeah, maybe Julio, do you want to, because you one thing you picked up yesterday as well as seeds is, is talk about technology, like we people might then have be able to have, just have wrist, um, technology to to kind of link into the yeah yeah so one thing that we were talking yesterday was that the inclusion right how to how to allow people without access to because blockchain for now is only accessible to a fraction of the population right it's it's highly uh complicated you have to know about uh uh you know complex password systems and, and having uh, devices and protecting your, you know, cryptographic signatures. And most people are, you know, they are very, very afraid of this, especially when, when you talk about money and say, your money is going to be locked into this thing. And they say, oh, uh, this is <laughs> because they are, they, they kind of, uh, they, they feel safe with a bank because they trust there's this big institution that's going to, if I have a problem, I can, can yell at them and have my kind of my money back. <laughs> at least they think so. And so the, the challenge we face is how to make this technology more accessible, right? And, and, and at Seeds, we, we, are, we, we are really concerned about this and we want local communities to have access to. And one of the ideas that's currently being implemented, actually we have the, the code kind of ready, but we still don't have the the device running. But it's like a, a bracer that you can wear with a QR code uh, that you can even hide if you want the, the code. And then you can use this bracer to link that to your account, maybe using someone else's computer or someone else's phone. And, and then you can use the bracer to kind of pay uh, in festivals or even in a local market. So you can use the bracer to check your balance and then to confirm that you want to buy this or to sell this. So, so in, this, in this solution, only the, the market needs to have maybe a cell phone to scan the QR code, but then uh, it's much more accessible. And, 
yeah, the other the other part is having a very easy to use uh, app, you know, because most crypto apps are very complex to get into, and uh, and that's that's going to be a key point in, in increasing adoption and making this solution work for every human, right? Not not just for the elite or early adopters. So yeah, that's definitely something we are paying attention to. Maybe and tell me off if if we're going too long on this question, but I think it's it's very very relevant. Um, uh, just to uh, jump to the comments a little bit in what it is that we're exploring there with seeds is uh, how to make it participatory, right? So so how can um, the communities come together and and make collective decisions? Um, and so what what we kicked off within uh, within seeds is the creation of a constitution on how we come together and how we make decisions, uh, both around currency but also around governance, um, so that uh, people in the, in the community can show up and actually uh, partake in uh, in decision making uh, either actively, right? So to show up and say, hey, I have a proposal to change how we make decisions either um, in the constitution of all of seeds or locally for my community uh, or, or passively. And, I, and, and I'm really excited about uh, this prospect. And it's really one of the areas where, where I think blockchain and DAOs can help in uh, distributing authority is to say, uh, I wanna show up and I, uh, I really trust Julio in his knowledge around X, Y, Z, around I know, water management. So whenever there's a question coming up around water management, I, I pledge my, my votes. I just vote along with Julio. I don't really know much about it, but I really like, like what Julio does. And for, uh, for uh, justice matters or conflict resolution matters, I'll do that with somebody else. And that way you can really, uh, you, you kind of move away from, I give all of my votes to one person like our, in our democracy, which is a wonderful innovation. Uh, and we have now the technology to move beyond that, to really allow communities to, to make decisions on a on, on multitude of, um, uh, of subjects while not necessarily knowing everything about everything, right? So um, I really love those experiments starting to show up. Um, I just want to throw it in because I think that's where it gets interesting on okay, how do we uh, decide around our common resources. I love that. Thank you. And that's so incredibly rich. I feel like we could keep talking about that for the whole hour. Um, it's fascinating. But let's jump on to the next one. Um, so, yeah, maybe um, Jessica, Olivia, you want to start with this one, because um, the next question is, what's your experience of managing conflict in the DAOs that you're a member of? Um, maybe you could just briefly explain what the conflict process is uh, in the common stack and like what the experience is. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, just so a, um, a clarification is that the conflict, um, the conflict managing working group that we have is on the token engineering commons. And there is a, it, there is an easy mix up about like, what is the TEC and what is the common stack. So the common stack is supporting the, the, the TEC with the cultural build. And um, uh, and also the technical build. And one of the parts that are very important for this process that we saw it was missing in a lot of DAOs that we had contact with was the, was the conflict manage, management solution and how to integrate this in the culture in a way that people feel like they're welcome to express issues that they're having, that there is uh, safety around this as well. So um, we have a, a working group called Gravity and Gravity in the sense that it pulls, it brings people together. So uh, the, the lead of this working group is Juan Carlos and he has a master's degree in conflict management and he's been uh, putting up this um, uh, the step-by-step -step that goes along with something that Ostrom talks about, that is the graduated sanctions. So we don't want to be a punishing culture, but we also don't want to let um, things that are harmful for the community to pass by uh, unnoticed or untreated. And 
Ostrom has a very beautiful approach to graduated sanctions because she talks about um, forgiveness of like the chance that the person who is maybe um, acting in misalignment with the collective uh, that through graduated sanctions, this person has the opportunity to forgive themselves in front of, of the community. So it's not something, uh, um, it's not that there is one solution for uh, all of the problems. It's important that if I like, if I am not accountable for something I promised I was gonna be accountable for. And I know that this affects others that I'm collaborating with. If I don't do this because I had a problem, but then the system doesn't give me any chance to say like, "Hey, let me let me do something. Let me let me feel better about this." Um, so with the graduated sanctions and with a, a positive monitoring, we we have been uh, seeing that uh, people do want to comply and do want to be within the boundaries more often than not. Um, and another point of the, that it's somehow unrelated. In the beginning, it was unrelated, but then now we see that is uh, very close to. So we have a praise system and praise is basically like everything that people do, you praise them for. So it's a very subjective system and you can praise someone for like a year of work or you can praise someone for being there for you and listening to what you had to say or helping you with some type of task. So it can be something very soft to something very grounded. And this uh, praise system ends up becoming a positive monitoring cycle because you can see what everyone is doing through the gratitude of the community. So um, there, it creates this awareness and also a bit of a relief if you like, you're, you're being praised about something and then you did something else that wasn't cool. So you know that you're not immediately this bad person. Like you don't identify with uh, one action because you understand that there is all of these other things that the community is, always look, is also looking at. So, so yeah, there's also a Graviton training that uh, Juan organized. And it was a, a training for eight weeks that people would attend and receive this po-ops that like Jess explained before, it, it was an NFT for like a badge for your participation. And then now we have the Gravitons that are the people that completed this training and now they are uh, ready to uh, mediate conflicts when they, emerge Love that. yeah um, julia or yoast uh, what's so is, is there something similar at seeds or how do you approach it yeah I, i'd like to talk about this as a little bit uh yeah this is amazing this this graviton i didn't know about this uh, gravity makes a lot of sense right so on haifa we have uh well, actually, we don't even call ourselves a DAO anymore. We call ourselves a distributed human organization or DHO, right? It's uh, because we really want to have the human at the center, right? And, and so uh, we, we say the main difference between the DAO that we are creating and the other ones, are, like we are in, very much inspired by um, uh, sociocracy and holacracy, and we have like roles and circles. And we really take uh, self-organization and and you know um, governance into the essence of the DAO, right? So this is the this makes us uh, kind of unique, and we do have badges too, <laughs> and uh, it's part of the it's part of the DHO, and. And the, the nice thing is that we have three kind of uh, poses that we want to organize. We, we kind of have the uh, distributed kind of pose for, for uh, making things happen, you know, operational poses. And then we have um, the human poses where we actually talk about human to human interaction without talking about roles or talking about uh, actual work. So we are talking about 
uh, getting humans uh, and, and, and seeing each other and connecting. And this is, this is central to have collaboration, right? In order to collaborate, you need to connect hearts in a sense, right? So that's, that's why uh, we, we value this. Uh, and then uh, we have the organizational calls for, for structure, for, for talking about organizational structure and how to improve our governance. So yeah, we kind of like to have this, this sort of poses and, and different kind of calls. Each circle has their own set of uh, agreements as well, and they can change the agreements. So yeah, actually conflict resolution is part of all circle meetings in a sense, right? Because we say we process tensions. And when we say the, the word tension, people say, oh, I don't want to have a tension, you know, because I'm, I'm just here, you know, but we, we, we see tensions as life, as the energy to change you know what's going on so if you have attention it means you are alive you're seeing something that can be improved right and, and we want people to bring tensions in and process this tension and in a in an owned form right it's not a group tension we don't have group tensions we have only uh, individual individuals with their uh, with their individual perspective on reality and, and they bring this perspective and we honor that and we process that and yeah so I, I think this is a key for how to expand the, the DAOs, especially in a fractal way, right? Because maybe a circle can become eventually their own uh, DAO or DHO in the future. So, yeah, so that's... Uh, and, and we do have gratitude tokens now. It's uh, similar to this praise functionality that Lydia was mentioning. It's, it's, in a, it's in an early stage. We are testing it, but I really um, have... Um, Faith, faith that this is going to improve the connection between humans and yeah it's very beautiful to see i love and how much your face sorry say again and we also have conflict right like uh, it, it it's nice nice to think about what we can do with it and it's messy and, and it's people and it needs work <laughs> just want yeah. to know that. <laughs> thank but you but you all have but you all share the both i think both organizations share i think the focus on the the human connection and how to keep yeah. it that and also looking at the systems, so that's really great. Let's pop on because we've still got a few more, we've got tons more questions and um, we're not going to get through all of them. So the next question we've got is, do you have any concerns about tokenizing commons? Maybe Jessica, you could start us off on that one. Okay, sure. And actually, I think um, this goes along a bit with a couple of things. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, in talking about conflict resolution, I think the context as well is moving from hierarchies to decentralized organizations. And it sounds very magical and wonderful and decentralization, but decentralization, you know, we think like power to the people, it's really responsibility to the people. It's really who's going to clean up after the party. These are the stewards of the commons. And um, so I think when it comes to conflict resolutions, there are many, many things happening. The incentive layer and the governance layer are probably the two biggest things. Money, you know, people fight over money, people fight over governance. These are the major areas of tensions and conflict in a lot of communities and even within our own families, within our own relationships. Um, so ways this could go wrong, uh, many. <laughs> That's why uh, it's really important to be intentional and, and really hold uh, this phase of creation or shared creation very sacred uh, because these incentive mechanisms are so incredibly powerful. And if you look at the systems that are being created, Bitcoin 2009, for the last 10 years, it's been the same extractive games of, you know, it, it's all about individual benefit and greed. And what we're trying to do uh, at the common stack and I know seeds and Haifa and so many incredible projects in this ecosystem are trying to say, let's, let's try to design these systems in a, an ethical and responsible way. And this is where token engineering comes in, this emerging field that's trying to come and say, let's look at science, let's use data, let's, let's model these systems like engineers when they build bridges, uh, they model, they test, they validate their designs. We are building the economic power grids and the governance power grids 
of the future now. And these dysfunctional patterns are so deeply conditioned and embed, embedded in these systems. So how do we create new, more regenerative, better patterns? And, you know, I would say that it actually starts from within. And there's this like fractal. I love that, you know, Julia, you had such a beautiful way to express some of your points. And I'm glad you brought up fractals. And, and Ostrom talks about nested institutions. But we can look at this in multiple perspectives. Uh, kind of an iceberg model. Um, so there's within ourselves, we have these repeated patterns that are so deeply conditioned. And then we are embedding this into our system and, and we're coming with these assumptions. So we have to start to try to unravel our biases and our assumptions. And now we have tools and technology, machine learning algorithms and neural networks that we're programming, but we have to be very careful about um, you know, what we're programming in these systems. So how could that go wrong many? Uh, my friend, she's about to quit Google. She tried to be the ethical AI director, but she says this is impossible. <laughs> so um, we have, there are possibilities for perverse incentives and even what's happening with Ethereum, it's a zero sum game. No, you know, it, it's, a, it's a race for greed. So we, that's why token engineering is so important that we take on this, like, we're gonna carry the flag for, responsible and ethical creation of these economic systems so that we don't recreate this dysfunctional patterns. Um, so there are many ways it can go wrong, uh, but if we take this engineering approach and do so ethically, uh, we have a better chance at least than maybe ever before with computer-aided governance, with you know the best of the machine learning and the humans at the end of the line making the decisions, uh, we have a better chance than we ever have before, at least. Um, I, I love that. I think that's so powerful. Um, what and what that kind of alludes to for me is it's really the, the the meta design, right? Like the the honoring that we don't know the impact of what it is that we're designing, and that needs to be part of the design. Um, like the, the, the way I've, I've come to this field is from a perspective of eliminating excessive discrepancies in our world altogether, which means uh, everybody impacted by uh, a decision and needs to be able to have a say in correcting it if it, if it creates harm. And, and this is where I think tokenization and DAOs can get really, really powerful uh, is kind of in reimagining what ownership is. All right. So when we think of ownership, it's, it's usually uh, you're an owner of something and then you have absolute power over it where right now we have the ability and this is like the um, we can have the ability if tokenization is done properly where you separate uh, financial risk and reward from operational decision making so uh, if, you, if you split those two out it's no longer possible to buy uh, power uh, and I think that's that's wonderful and key like if a project doesn't have that, I am not partaking. So if I can come in and buy uh, a majority say in what's happening, I don't trust that project. Um, if I step into a project and those with all the voice of making decisions have a, a proven track record um, to, to, uh, in, in creating impact and showing up, uh, that's building trust for me. So I, I think that's really where, where the innovation uh, in, in my opinion, comes from is this reimagining and uh, redefining what ownership means and how we interact with ownership. Um, wonderful exploration. That's great, Julia. Do you want to jump in? Um, Livia, sorry. Do you want to jump in quickly, and then we'll we'll try and get one last question in. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'll be quick. I I resonate so much with this, uh, especially with the point that the the change starts within and that that is the major point that it could go wrong is if we um, don't take the ownership over our decisions and our decision-making capabilities. I think we've been so removed from the understanding of the power of our decisions. Like we, um, I think we, we often think that like democracy or that the voting systems we have, we only participate in them once every four years when we're putting a vote up there, but we are making decisions all the time, especially when we are spending our money 
Like if I'm spending on the on the restaurant in the corner, I'm staking on the existence of that restaurant. And all of the decisions I make all the time, they're having an impact on the continuity of narratives, not only of uh, physical places, but what is the message that is being shared from those people and from those places. And I think once we start questioning what are the decisions that I am capable of and that I feel comfortable with, what are the decisions that are on my on the edge of my comfort zone, and what are the decisions that I am completely incapable of taking and that I would rather uh, delegate to someone else. So we're starting to introduce delegating uh, voting systems, but I think this um, this questioning, this self evaluation of what can I make a decision and what I should delegate and start having um, the self knowledge that I feel like it's very um, scary, some scary sometimes. And uh, it's scary to think of making my own incentives, because that means knowing myself, and maybe that will be uncomfortable. And, and then we often don't have places to talk about our uncomfortable feelings and emotions. And then this gets um, uh, stuck. And I think this is one of the places where it could go wrong if we don't start opening spaces to uh, unblock this uh, talks about emotions, self-knowledge and feelings and uh, the decisions and the power that we have it's really fascinating because I think the threads through a lot of this is about a level of personal development and self-awareness that we as people have to do to be able to use these tools well. That seems to be what I'm hearing a lot, that the tools themselves are, are really fascinating and useful tools. But if we're not doing the personal work to kind of match where we're heading to, um, yeah, that feels really important. Amazing. I just want to, there's just one last question. I just want to quickly, it might be quite an interesting ending kind of question for you all to jump in on. So the, the question is, are DAOs trustless? And if so, what does this mean? Maybe, um, Yost, if we start with, with you. Um, well, if, um, if they are, and that's the complete organization, I'm not part of it. <laughs> um, so the... Um, I think there's a really, I think we could spend a couple of hours exploring what trust actually means, by the way, um, but, but let's park that for now. I think the, the more interesting thing to me, uh, what DAOs allow is, um, when, you, when you talk about trust, I think it has a lot to do with power and power abuse or the lack thereof, right? If there is a little power abuse, there is more room for trust to grow. And I think that's what DAOs can offer. They can offer uh, to free us, from some explicit power abuse rooted in ownership, right? If we think of any company, your boss has power over you or uh, a CEO has power over you or shareholders have power over you. Uh, in a DAO, we have explicit ownership and operational decision-making and that power over you is now at least in the explicit form of how you are compensated and how you, if you are or not, or are not a member of this community, uh, is taken out of the equation so you can show up with uh, fewer power abuses and that allows i think for for more trust to grow um but if uh, so so uh, i um that's actually the first question i asked when i uh, joined decided to join hi-fi is um do you guys see this as a trustless or a trustful organization and the answer was human trustful i said okay let's continue talking um Brilliant. I think that's how I would frame it. Yeah, thank if you. I, if Brilliant. I can add, like, uh, yeah, <clears throat> add to that. So uh, one thing that I, I, I'm seeing in the DAO movement is that we are kind of getting to a DAO 2.0 version, right, in a sense, right? Because the first DAOs, they, they were uh, very much around this trustless uh, idea that the blockchain kind of provides. So you trust the smart contract you trust the code and code is law you know so everyone is kind of serving the code like a, a, a super intelligent computer that's taking the decisions 
but this is this is never going to happen you know because in the end we are all humans and uh, there are always the humans on the other end of the of the contract right so if these contracts don't take into account the humans uh they they are going to be uh worthless in the end right because uh, they should be serving us we are the ones uh, that are going to benefit from that so uh this 2.0 version of the DAOs, maybe that it's evolving is one that's going to drive um clarity and and uh aut aut autonomy right for 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 their uh for their users and their the people using um interacting with it so I think that's where we are heading, and I think the, the DAOs that are going to uh, stay and continue are the ones that are taking into account the humans and and allowing humans to function better as a planet. You know, so because that's where we are heading to become a planet, right? And and we need tools for that, and now we have those tools. We just need to kind of wake up and say, oh, we can do this. So, thank you. Yeah, that's Brilliant. that's how I see. Thanks, Julian. Livia, maybe, I'm really sorry, we're coming up to just a minute, so we're going to have to keep this last one short, but Livia, what would you say? I think trustless technologies allow for trustful connections. So the, the technology itself is trustless because it's transparent, because uh, there's no humans involved on uh, the transactions that are happening, uh, I mean, not so many humans involved like we have in the, in, in, in the other systems, but um, once these tools are very transparent, you can see everything that is happening, then the relations have that weight off their shoulders and they can focus more on the relational fabric and building trust between humans. Brilliant, thank you. And Jessica? Yeah, I'll, I know we're up in the hour here, but I guess there's two things involved in trustless. There's truth and kind of saying, you know, there's a mechanism in place that all parties can say, like, this is the canonical or the ultimate truth. And the second aspect is um, this group can be trusted to uh, make self-serving decisions that are also aligned with the collective. And that's exactly what we're focused on in the common stack. And the sense of truth, I don't wanna get into, is there an absolute truth? Uh, but I guess the most interesting thing is now uh, we can model and design systems uh, around uh, consensus. Um, so we can incentivize people to make decisions that are the best for, the, for themselves, but that also serve the collective. So you know, you can come in and you can engage with cryptocurrency and you can make money, but we have to employ mechanisms that redirect and create uh, feedback loops that serve the collective. So that's what we're doing um, with some of the tools that we're building. Um, and when it comes to consensus and governance with these tokenized systems, we can relocalize uh, decision-making so to the people that are closely affected and again, have these kind of like nested fractal layers and governance is polycentric. So there are places where hierarchies make sense. There are places where we need flatter decision-making. Um, we need, you know, uh, liquid democracy or vote delegation. So it's a wide open design space and we look forward to exploring further with anyone um, who wants to come and, and explore with us absolutely incredible thank you all so much it's been so fascinating and you know you're all here giving your time um for free to come along and share with us like the absolute wealth of experience so thank you and to our participants thank you for being here i'll share in the um uh post event details um our panels details again so if you want to get in touch with them about anything i'm sure it'll be more than happy to answer any questions or I'll also put some more details about the projects and organizations they're here from. So when you're ready participants if you want to um, take yourselves off mute and just say a quick thank you to everyone I'm sure that'd be really appreciated. Thank you. 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 Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll be here for a couple really. more minutes if anyone wants to say but I'll stop the recording now and um, yeah.